Welcome to the North American Hunting Odyssey, where members experience and share the odyssey we call the hunt. This program has been created specially for members of the North American Hunting Club. Survival of the fittest. It's tough and unforgiving. It's nature's way. NAHC members got it a lot easier. We can sit back, relax, and enjoy the learning experience with just the push of a button. Sharing experience is what the hunting odyssey is all about. This excellent video traces the origins of bow hunting, explores the legacy of firearms, and finally takes us on an exciting turkey hunt. This will be a fun learning experience. In prehistoric times, every man was a hunter. The bow provided sustenance and protection for tribal peoples. Later, with the invention of firearms, bow hunting disappeared in all but the most primitive areas. It was lost for a time, but only temporarily. It resurfaced in the late 1800s. Maurice and Will Thompson, growing up in the hills of Georgia, learned to make crude bows and arrows playing Robin Hood in the lush countryside. Their skills were refined by an old hermit living nearby. After the Civil War, guns were denied them by Union law, and the bow became their means of sustenance. Their book, The Witchery of Archery, led to some popularity for the sport and the formation of a few archery clubs, notably the NAA. But archery was not yet a household word. Modern bow hunting began with Ishi, a Yana Indian who emerged from the forests of Northern California in 1911. He was the last of his race and had lived his life in the manner of his forefathers, without knowledge of or contact with the white man's culture. In need of medical care, Ishi met Dr. Saxton Pope, and the two became fast friends. Ishii taught Dr. Pope all he knew about the making and using of the bow and arrow. Pope became an avid bow hunter and wrote a book on the subject. Together with his friend Art Young, Pope tested shooting equipment all over North America and Africa and successfully brought down wild sheep, moose, grizzly bear, and many other species. These pioneers are generally regarded as the forefathers of modern bow hunting. Today, the prestigious Pope and Young Club documents the finest trophies of North American big game taken with bow and arrow. A young man recovering from an injury read Pope's book and made a bow and arrows according to its instructions. One day, while practicing with his homemade equipment in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, an older gentleman approached. That's a mighty fine looking bow you got there, son, he said. Where'd you learn to make such a bow? I read a book on it by Dr. Pope, he replied. The older gentleman then introduced himself as Dr. Saxton Pope. The young man was Doug Easton, and a new era in arrow making began. In 1922, Easton began producing custom-made yew wood bows and cedar arrows. Frustrated with the lack of arrow uniformity, he began manufacturing arrows from aluminum tubing in 1939. Although society has changed since man first drew a bowstring, the philosophy and spirit of the bow hunter remains, providing an enduring link with the values of the past. These bow hunters are willing to meet nature on her own terms. As today's best known bow hunter, Chuck Adams is such a man. Ironically, Adams was born and grew up within 18 miles of Ishii's home territory, the same general location where Pope, Young, and Easton began shooting bows. Dad spent the largest part of his life in uh, Northern California's Ishii country. He killed his first buck there with a rifle when he was 18 years old. He brought me hunting uh, in the woods in Ishii country when I was uh, just a little kid. I followed him around in the woods 
and I uh, killed my first buck with a rifle when I was 12 years old. By the time I was 15, I realized that uh, hunting the blacktails in Northern California with a rifle was becoming too easy, so I turned to bow hunting. I bagged my first buck with a bow uh, in Ishi country when I was 16 years old. I'm largely self-taught as a bow hunter. My dad has never seriously hunted with a bow. So when I took up the bow, I taught myself to shoot. I taught myself to move within close range of animals. And I did so without the help of books or magazine articles because at that time there was very little written on bow hunting. When a bow hunter enters the woods, he experiences a satisfaction known to few. He has studied the terrain. He understands the quarry. He possesses the tools and skills to survive on his own. It is meeting this challenge that provides the excitement of bow hunting. I've been fortunate enough to hunt all over the world with a bow and arrow, but my favorite place to bow hunt is still Ishi country. The animals there are more difficult than any other place I've hunted uh, because there are so many hunters in California today and because the terrain is so severe. But for sure, hunting challenge, Ishi country is still the best. Chuck must study his prey carefully because he knows that only a thorough understanding of its habits and habitats will guide him to the proper range. My main goal at the present time is to bag all 27 North American species with a bow and arrow. At present, I have more species than any other bow hunter in history. Uh, the Pope and Young Record Book Club uh, named after Pope and Young of Ishi country, recognizes 27 species, and I'm getting very close to taking all 27. With any luck, I'll have those within the next two years. Pronghorn antelope are exciting, fleet-footed targets. Chuck prefers to wait in a blind near a water hole until they drift in to drink. The final test comes in the seconds just before Chuck releases the arrow. He must judge distance, trajectory, and point of impact in a single calculation. The flight of his arrow will precisely reflect the accuracy of his judgment. Pursuing the quarry and the anticipation of the kill, these are the most exciting parts of bow hunting. But there are many other rewards. This fat two by two mule deer was Adam's smallest ever, but it provided mouth-watering meat for the table. For the bow hunter, the challenges of nature are many. This particularly strenuous hunt took place in northern Arizona's Hualapai Canyon. Adams and his guide glassed rams from cliffs over 900 feet high. Adams shot this full-curl desert ram at 30 yards. This completed his grand slam of North American sheep. It was the fourth in the history of bow hunting and the only Grand Slam to be completed on four consecutive bow hunts. Often, completing the kill is only the beginning of the challenge. Then, you have to get your prize home. Bow hunting can be a solitary sport, or if the hunter so chooses, good company can be had as well. Chuck's wife, Joanne, often bow hunts with him. Bow hunting has allowed me to meet uh, dozens and dozens of great people. Bow hunters as a group are friendly, outgoing people. Uh, the bow hunting fraternity has given me hundreds and hundreds of hours of enjoyment in camps uh, across North America and abroad. Great accuracy can be developed with practice. A proficient bow hunter can regularly shoot a three inch target at 20 yards and consistently kill larger animals at 50 yards. Often, bagging a real prize means braving challenges of climate and hostile terrain as well. April of 1989 saw Adams on one of his most exciting hunts. The quarry was Polar Bear on northeastern Canada's Baffin Island. Adams and his Eskimo guide covered 150 miles by dog sled, camping in an oil-heated tent. A stalk up near a vertical rock pile brought Adams face to face with this 900 pound bear. He dropped it at 20 yards. This was the only polar bear ever stalked and shot by a modern bow hunter and one of less than a dozen taken by archers in this century. Adams prefers remote locations for his hunting trips. In 1988, he journeyed to Newfoundland to bow hunt woodland caribou. 
Soon, after a float plane ride to the remote interior, Chuck and his guide were glassing the tundra for caribou. After following this rutting caribou for more than five miles, he crawled within 55 yards and made a pinpoint shot through both lungs. The animal was a giant, number four in the bow hunter's record book, and the best woodland bull shot by an archer since 1966. One of the great things about bow hunting is its versatility. When hunting season is over, Adams, like many bow hunters, enjoys the sport of bow fishing as well. Of course, proper equipment and maintenance is essential to a successful hunt. Chuck is widely recognized for his technical knowledge and meticulous testing of archery equipment. He has written over 2,200 articles and seven books on the subject. I think it's really important for beginners to realize that they should purchase top-rate equipment and learn to use it well. Bow hunters who ignore these simple facts usually get within range of animals and then miss the mark. I shoot only aluminum arrows made by Easton because they're precise, they're perfectly straight, and they're easy to tune up. Shooting equipment is every bit as important as hunting skill in the woods. When you get one of these in your sights, you don't want to miss. Adams approached within 20 yards and shot this 600-pound trophy grizzly with an Easton XX-75 camo hunter shaft. The bear let out a roar, galloped 46 yards, and dropped like a rock. How does Chuck Adams feel about the future of bow hunting? The future of bow hunting is very, very bright. Habitat is shrinking across the United States and Canada as the human population grows. And as a result, uh, I think bow hunting is the wave of the future. Gun seasons are very short these days. Bag limits are very small compared to bow hunting limits. So sportsmen who love the outdoors are uh, well advised to spend as much time bow hunting as possible. Few activities can provide the satisfaction of bow hunting. The sense of self-sufficiency, achievement, and feeling as one with nature are unsurpassed. For the outdoor experience, opportunities, and challenge, bow hunting provides the ultimate adventure for the sportsman. I wish that everyone could enjoy bow hunting as much as I have over the past 20 years. It's a great sport, and the future is very bright for bow hunting. Are you ready, Mr. Browning? Ready on the firing line. Commence firing. Whether you call them firearms, weapons, guns, or hunting companions, they've been with us for centuries. Affectionately, they've been nicknamed Old Betsy, Big Medicine, the Peacekeeper, and numerous other terms of endearment. Did you ever wonder where your firearm came from? Who invented it? Where was it made? There's always been something that man has devised to project himself and his skills in hunting, fighting, or in sport. Following the discovery of gunpowder by the Chinese, history records the use of firecrackers for amusement and then firearms for sport and defense. The first type of firearm was a hand cannon or powder shaft appearing in Europe in the mid 14th century. This is the earliest known datable hand cannon dug up in Germany and it dates from a battle in 1299. Simply a tube, bronze, about 12 inches long, 60 caliber. 
to operate it, it was placed on a shaft, hammered down so it would stick. It was muzzle loaded in much the same fashion that our muzzle loaders are today from a powder flask, and then a patch and ball placed on top and rammed home. The fire then took a semi-aim and put a match cord to the touch hole which ignited the gunpowder inside. After the invention of the firearm, innovative ways of igniting the gunpowder inside the gun were devised. The matchlock was developed in Europe in the mid-15th century. It was called a matchlock because a match or a rope wick, usually a cotton cord soaked in saltpeter, was used to ignite the powder. The word lock means the mechanism for igniting the powder. This is an authentic matchlock of the 1500s. It enabled man for the first time to take aimed fire. After being muzzle loaded like other muzzle loaders, the pan was filled, the powder covered, and the match cord was lit. The match could be advanced as it burned down. At the moment of firing, the weapon was raised, the cover to the pan opened, and simply the trigger was pulled and the match lit the main charge. The wheel lock was developed again in Europe in the early 16th century, a rather ingenious but costly mechanism for igniting the gunpowder. The wheel was wound about three quarters of a turn with a tool called a spanner. When released, the pyrite rubbing against the revolving serrated wheel made sparks which ignited the powder in the priming pan and in turn ignited the powder in the barrel through the touch hole. The wheel lock was more reliable than the match lock. Because of the cost, often the owners of such firearms were the wealthy. With ownership came competition for fancier and more costly pieces. Note the intricate carvings on the gun stock. Firearms became works of art. Even gun barrels demonstrated the ability of the artisan. Damascus barrels were the more popular because of the barrel strength and pattern design through hand-forged layering. Later in the 16th century, flint ignition became popular. Forerunners to the true flintlock design, the snappins and the Michelet lock systems were invented, but used for a limited time. Developed in France, the flintlock was distinguished by its combined flash pan cover and steel or frizzen and by its internal mainspring and half-cock and full-cock mechanism. By 1660, the flintlocks had spread throughout Western Europe and were exported to North America in large quantities. Until 1825, most firearms in the Western world were flintlocks. Then from Scotland came the percussion cap, which alleviated the need for a flintlock mechanism. When the cap was struck by the hammer of the firearm, it ignited the powder in the barrel. Firing a gun started getting easier. Liège was at that time one of the major, if not the major, gun making center of the world. And there was a habit for American inventors or other inventors in Europe to come to Liège to have their patents manufactured here. And so did he at the time. Uh, it's quite an old tradition. Benjamin Franklin already came to Liège to buy weapons for the American so-called insurgents during the War of Independence. But later in the 19th century, uh, great American inventors like uh, Colt, Borchardt, uh, Colonel Lewis, uh, Browning, of course, came to Liège to have some of their weapons produced by the local gun makers. Jonathan Browning was an early American jack of all trades and gun maker. In the early 1830s, he invented these two firearms, which represent some of the earliest repeating rifles in America. Called a slide gun or harmonica rifle, the magazine of this gun is simply a rectangular bar chambered for powder and ball with cut in nipples integral with the metal, one at the rear end of each chamber. The length of the magazine and its consequent capacity was limited by convenience. Jonathan considered five shots about right. The receiver is a frame which houses the magazine and on which the hammer and trigger are hung. An ingenious small lever, thumb-operated, 
moves the magazine to successive firing positions, not only locking it, but camming it forward to a gas-tight fit against the bore of the barrel. With a breech-loading system and the percussion cap in the early 19th century, a new era dawned on firearms evolution, the revolving cylinder. Samuel Colt was the first U.S. inventor and manufacturer to capitalize on this. His six-shooter was caught up in the Industrial Revolution and was the first firearm to be mass-produced. In early North America, voyagers and trappers, pioneers and travelers in general, always had a firearm with them wherever they went. They were not a luxury item. Then, a firearm gave meaning to the terms of weapon and hunting companion. A gun put food on the table. It offered protection. It was a way of life. Jonathan Browning's son, John Moses Browning, in about 1865, decided to make his own gun. At age 10, he wired an old discarded barrel to a stock whacked out of a 2x4, and together with his brother Matt, they went after some prairie chickens. Either from the rust in the barrel or an over-generous powder charge, they netted three birds in one shot. John would later produce 44 gun designs for the Winchester Company, including several lever-action models. John Browning often said, the best gun is the simplest gun. Once worked out mechanically, the lever-action principle appears simple enough. Lowering the lever pulls back the breech block cocks the hammer and expels the cartridge case from the previous round. Pulling the lever back up sends the breech block forward again, lifting a new cartridge from the magazine and into the chamber. John also said, it's not so hard figuring out the essentials of a gun mechanism. The trouble is getting the essentials in the right place. This was a time of fertile creativity, spurred on by the necessity and desire for better firearms, not only for protection and practical use, but also for sport shooting. In the mid-19th century, center and rim fire cartridges were developed, which also furthered the development of new types of firearms. The creative spark is often nothing more than the faintest glimpse of an idea. Many of John Browning's ideas were born that way. Browning would later come to be called the father of modern firearms development. In the spring of 1889, at the weekly shooting match at the Ogden Rifle Club, John and his brothers were waiting for Will Wright, who was firing at the target. Sack the rifles, boys. I got me an idea. As they returned to the shop, John then explained to his brothers that he figured the same force which caused the grass to shake from the muzzle blast could be harnessed to make the gun work automatically. John grabbed a rifle, which was handy, wired it to an inch board, then drilled a hole in a piece of wood for the bullet to pass through. Hand me that block of wood. Now, if my theory is correct, the muzzle blast should send that block of wood hell winding. He figured that the block of wood close to the end of the barrel would demonstrate his theory. The muzzle blast did send that block of wood across the shop. Within a day, he had a lever arm and pan attached, activating the lever action of the rifle, which caused it to fire automatically. 
The original prototype, without the lever, shows the crude hammer marks where he affixed a flapper and pan to the end of a 73 Winchester. By 1890, John filed a patent for the gas-operated automatic machine gun. That same year, he wrote out a letter in longhand to the Colt factory asking if they were interested in that kind of a gun. Early in 1891, he and Matt arrived at the Colt factory for a demonstration. Onlookers were surprised to see this crude-looking prototype firing automatically with simply the push of a button. Hidden smiles were soon erased as John's hammer-beaten model fired 200 rounds without a hitch. As early as 1895, Browning had a workable machine gun which would later be adopted by the U.S. military for its World War I effort. With the development of the machine rifle and the machine gun came the invention of the semi-automatic or self-loading pistol. Colt and Fabrique Nationale, known as FN, began producing 25 and 38 caliber pistols. FN's pistols were adopted as official sidearms in some European armies. Colt requested a larger version to meet U.S. Army requests, and the 45 caliber was produced. In 1906, the 45 caliber pistol was submitted to U.S. Army ordinance for review. Finally, the competitive trials were set for March 3rd, 1911. Six thousand rounds were to be fired through each pistol under consideration. In a series of 100s, cool for five minutes, then fired again. too hot, it was simply dropped into a bucket of water. The trials ran through two days of firing. Seven rounds to a clip, clip after clip. the booming came to a halt. That's it. You did it. Three cheers for Mr. Browning. Congratulations. The Congratulations. pistol Thank became you. the Thank first you. automatic Thank arm to make a perfect Thank score you. in government trials. While military demands brought about some incredible weapons, they have also helped to improve different kinds and styles of sporting firearms. And just like early European firearms ownership, expensive forms of gun ownership have maintained appeal. In Liège, Belgium, some of the world's greatest gun engravers still ply their trade. Over 200 strong a century ago, just 20 remain today, but their craftsmanship is still breathtaking. subject, but some designs are more elaborate. Gold inlay, the history of an empire, a tribute to a great man, commissioned royal gifts to heads of state. Anywhere from a full day to 175 days are required in the engraving of one firearm. Special commissioned pieces will sell for tens of thousands of dollars. In 600 years, firearms have evolved from simple fire shafts and hand cannons to magnificent sporting arms and colossal military weaponry. The basic principles, however, are the same. 
Ignited gunpowder propels a projectile which is aimed at a target. From simple weapons to hand-carved and engraved works of art, the firearm has had a very remarkable and enduring evolution which continues today. Think of it. Just a few centuries ago, a firearm sometimes meant life or death to our ancestors. Today, they are a chosen luxury with which we can hunt or participate in shooting events. Let us all do our part to act responsibly and ensure the preservation of this rich heritage and legacy. This next session is the most exciting part I believe I've ever been involved in with the True Series videos. And share that with us. And then our very special guest from Game Fish Department is Mr. Jerry Hazelwood. Jerry, we are proud to have you here with us. Thanks, Bob. Proud to be here. Uh, glad to be able to show the sportsmen a little bit about what goes into getting turkeys started in a part of the state where they're desperately needed. Uh, surveys show that the number of turkey hunters is steadily increasing, puts more of a demand on our available resources. So the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks is trying to stock turkeys in parts of the state that don't currently have turkeys build up a population for the sportsmen. So I guess it's uh, something y'all look for is landowners who are willing to cooperate that do have a lot of turkeys that allow y'all to come in and trap them and relocate them to other parts of the state. That's right. We have some very gracious sportsmen's groups and landowners that are willing to let us come in and take a few turkeys off their place because they know that if it wasn't for somebody else who's doing the same thing, they probably wouldn't have birds on their property. Mm -hmm. Listen, Will, this is some wonderful footage, and this is what turkey hunting for tomorrow and for my children and, and the sportsmen out there watch the video of their children ensuring that they have turkeys hunt, and I think everybody's really going to enjoy it. Great. This first scene is positioning the cannons over the 40 by 60 nylon mesh net that we use to trap the turkeys, and here you see we've loaded the charges getting ready to cover it up so the turkeys can't see it. The cannon shoots out, shoots the net out over the bait site, which is about six feet in front of the net. It's important to have all your knots secured and have the net completely covered. We're looking at a turkey's eye view of three birds from one camera angle with the other camera in the deer stand in the background. We've got three birds here, a few more come. We've got a total of 10 gobblers on the bait site. You have to make sure all heads are down when the net goes off. Looks like we've got them all down. There they are. I take a piece of old parachute material, which is permeable to air, and puts the turkeys in the dark. When you cover them up, they tend to settle down and not flop around. That way they don't lose as many feathers or injure themselves. It takes a little while to work the birds out of the net, so you make sure you've got them all covered up where they'll be nice and still. There they are. Let's look again. We leg band each of our turkeys in the, right between the time we shot the net and this scene it started a pretty good rain shower. Typically don't shoot nets over birds in the rain. You tend to damage the feathers too bad, but we already had them down, so we had to go ahead and get them out. We double check the band numbers so we can write it on the box. So if we have birds going to more than one location, we know which band numbers went to each location. Easy does it. We put them on the truck, all safe and secure in the little box, and they're ready to go to a new home.
Steve Burnett can definitely cut and yelp on that limb hanger mouth call. Watch this gobbler when he comes up to the right of that big tree. When he gets to where he thinks he ought to be able to see the hen that's been calling to him, he definitely looks.
Siete. Watch this hen sneak into all the calling. As close as she got, she never saw him until Jolly shoot her away.
And thanks to all of you for watching and being part of the North American Hunting Odyssey.